buckle up everyone, because we're about to go for one heck of a ride. Buckling is not only an important step each and every time you get in your car for safety, but it's also the topic of today's lecture. Let's get started. In today's lecture, we're going to go over a couple of different things. The first thing we're going to do is talk about buckling and what is involved in the equation and how to calculate it. After we do that, we'll go over some real-world applications of the buckling equation and show how real engineers use it in real-world systems. Last but not least, we'll go over a couple of different example problems so that by the end of this lecture, hopefully you'll have a both a conceptual understanding of the concept of buckling as well as an idea of how to apply it both in the real world and to statics problems. Let's begin with a brief introduction to buckling and an overview of the equation. To introduce buckling, let's look back at something else you learned in a previous unit, which was the fact that a column in compression can fail due to stress. If the rupture stress or the ultimate stress of a column is exceeded, we know that it would crush or be destroyed. But that's just one type of failure. The other way that that column could fail would be in buckling. And you can see that the buckling equation, which we'll explain in a little bit, kind of relates to Young's modulus, the stiffness of the material, as well as the moment of inertia and the length. Now, to give you an overview of what buckling is, let's look at the picture below to see what a member in compression looks like when it buckles. As you can see, a member in buckling is subjected to compression and begins to bend or bow out or buckle under the weight that's applied to it. Now, buckling can only occur to members that are in compression. And what we're going to see and learn is that it depends very much on the things we just discussed in the formula. So if we look at this equation more closely, we can see that E is Young's modulus, which we discussed in material properties. We can see that I is the moment of inertia. L is the length of the overall member. It's height, pretty much, or width, depending on how it's being compressed, vertically or horizontally. And K is this thing that we're going to talk about in a little bit, more detail in a moment, which is the effective length factor. Now you can see another example of buckling right beneath me, which is that when a beam experiences too much compression, depending on how that beam is set up, it can actually fail, not in compression, but in buckling. And when we look at this equation here, the equation essentially for P critical means the load that's necessary to cause that structure to, to fail and buckle. So a low p-critical means that that structure is weak. It's very easy to buckle. But a large p-critical means that that structure is very strong and is less likely to buckle. So a large p-critical, at least from an engineering standpoint, is a good thing about your design. It would mean that your beam or column is very unlikely to buckle. So how do we do that in our equation? If we increase the stiffness of a material, we're going to increase the force necessary to buckle it. I think that that makes sense because if we were trying to buckle a piece of rubber, you could imagine if you had a rubber column, it would be all over the place. But if you had a concrete column, it'd be much more stiff and less likely to buckle. Similarly, a high moment of inertia is also going to result in a larger peak critical. We know that a moment of inertia kind of relates to the amount of area that you have, how spread out your mass is from the previous unit. So you could imagine that if you had a very, very small like circular column, that'd be much more easy to bend. So if we can increase the mass away from the center of mass of that column, it's going to be less likely to buckle. And we'll show some more examples of that moving forward. Last but not least, you could imagine just in your head that the larger something is, the easier it would be to cause it to bend. If you had a, like a one inch tall cube and you tried to push on it so that it would bend, there's not really much to bend. So by decreasing the length, we increase the force necessary to buckle something. So what this tells you is that structures that are very large have a much higher likelihood of buckling when their length is very long. And this idea of K is K is effective length factor. And I'll explain this a little bit more in the next slides. Okay, let's talk about K, the effective length factor, and see what it's all about. So K, it seems a little bit nebulous just in this equation here, but it's a unitless thing and it's just a multiplier by the length. And you can see that that entire bottom part of our formula is going to be squared. So it's K times L all squared. So what K is referring to is how much of the length of the beam or column you have is actually free to bend. So that's why we call it the effective length factor. So let's look at the 
effective length factor for the first example on the far left. This is when you have k equal to 1, where 100% of the length of the member can actually buckle and fail. This is the situation where you have a pin at the top and a pin at the bottom. And you can see that the beam is totally free to rotate about both of those pins, left and right. So as a result, 100% of the beam is available to actually buckle. So that's where we say that the K is 1. It says that essentially the entire length of the beam, as you can see in the diagram below, can buckle. When you look at an example where it's pinned and fixed, you could imagine that if that beam or column is fixed at the ground, that bottom part is kind of more rigid and it's less likely to bend. So the K of 0 0.7 basically means that only 70% of the overall length can really buckle. So essentially, it's going to be shorter length, which makes it harder to buckle. And you can see kind of in this picture here that the only portion that's really bending is about the 70% of the column right there. When you have it fixed fixed, that's where you have k equals 0 0.5. Because if it's fixed at the top and fixed at the bottom, really those two ends are very rigid and aren't likely to bend. So the only part of the beam that's actually going to bend is about the middle 50%, whereas the top and the bottom are gonna really fight that and stay pretty much straight. And the last example, which we very seldom use in this class, is where we have fixed free. And this is k equals two. And this is actually a little bit of an interesting case but you assume almost that the column is twice as long as it is because if it's totally free at the top, then it can bend even further than if it was pinned. So you essentially are assuming that double the length can actually bend. And as you can see, as you go from left to right, generally it gets from k equals one to k equals 0 0.5, it becomes harder to buckle because the effective length is getting shorter. And as you can see in the equation here, if the length goes down, then the p-critical will go up. So it'll make it harder to buckle. So that is what the effective length factor is. Let me show you a demo now with my trusted demo stick to help illustrate some of these concepts that we've just talked about. So, as I was saying, I've got my handy dandy demonstration stick. And it's very good for showing not only moments of inertia, but also the concept of buckling. So let me show you the stick a little bit closer and talk about what we're gonna do. What you can see in this close-up of the stick is that its height is much taller than its width. So the question that we're gonna be investigating in this demo is, is it going to be easier to buckle this cross-section about the axis that passes through the horizontal portion of the stick? Or is it gonna be easier to buckle this beam through a vertical cross-section that passes through the centroid. As you can see with that close-up look at the stick, the stick is much taller on one side than it is on the other. So you may have guessed that it's gonna be easier if I try and bend the stick this way. You can see that that's not too hard. You can clearly see that I've kind of put a bend into it. But if I flip it and I try and bend it about the axis that's got the tall end in it, well then you can see even though I'm exerting quite a good amount of force here, there's almost no bend in this stick at all. Whereas if I did that same exact thing on the short cross section, it's very easy. Tall cross section, ah, I can't do it. Now let's look at another stick for comparison. This time I've got a stick in my right hand that is quite a bit smaller than the one in my left that we were just looking at. The stick in my right hand is not only smaller in cross section, but it's also a good deal longer than the previous stick. So as a result, it should be much easier to actually buckle or bend. Now, one thing to note about this new stick is that it actually has some similarities to the previous one. And that one dimension of our stick, because it's a rectangle, is quite tall, whereas the other is quite skinny. So if I twist the stick this way again, here I've got the tall side and here's the short side. Just like before, bending it about the short side is very, very easy but trying to bend it about the long side or tall side is a great deal harder. You may see that I'm doing it a little bit, but it's still much more challenging than doing it about this side right here. So what we can see through this demonstration is that the moment of inertia of an object is very, very important in buckling, but it's the moment of inertia about both the X and the Y axes that's gonna come into play.
And in the example problems that we do, you're always going to want to be choosing the smallest moment of inertia of the shape in question, because that is going to be the one that is more likely to buckle under a lower load than the other one, which is barely going to buckle at all. So hopefully this concept will become a little bit more clear and evident as we go through some more examples in the rest of this lecture. So as you can see in that example that I just showed you, we can see that the moment of inertia of the sticks cross-section has a big impact on which way the beam itself was going to buckle. So just to reiterate everything we just talked about, look at the example below, which shows you that the stick was taller than it was wide. So think about this question for a second. Is it going to be easier to buckle this stick about the blue axis, the Y axis, or is it easier to buckle the stick about the X axis? So I just showed you this demo, but just think through a little bit how you would calculate the moments of inertia and by what magnitude the moment of inertia about the Y or the X is lower than that of the other. So pause your video, take a second, and just think through conceptually the demo I just showed you and apply it to this example right here. So after you've thought about it for a little while, what you should realize is that the moment of inertia about the y-axis is going to be substantially smaller than the moment of inertia about the x-axis. So as a result of that, p-critical is going to be much lower about the y-axis. It's going to be easier to bend the stick about this cross-section than it is for me to bend the stick about that cross-section there, which is the x-axis. So hopefully this helps to illustrate the concept of buckling and how important moment of inertia is in its calculation. Now let's go over some real world applications of how buckling influences engineering design in the real world. Let's look at this example right here for a real world application. You may remember in material properties we discussed how good the compressive strength of concrete was. And we calculated that in order for a six inch cylinder of concrete to fail under its own weight, it would have to be 4,800 feet tall to effectively crush itself. Now, this is only one type of failure as we've discussed. This column can also technically buckle. So would the six inch column, if it was 4,800 feet tall, mighty impressive, would that column buckle before it was crushed under its own weight? So I want you to take the p-critical equation that we just learned a little while ago, take everything you know about concrete on this slide right here, and figure out whether or not this column would actually fail under its own load. So if you use the critical buckling equation, we know everything in this equation. We've been given a K, which we're assuming this column is fixed and fixed at the top and the bottom. We're assuming the L is 4,800 feet tall. We've got the E, which is 5,000 PSI. And the moment of inertia would just be pi over 64 times the diameter to the fourth which is the area moment of inertia for a circle or a cylinder. So we do that calculation. We can plug in all of our numbers. And what we get is that the critical buckling load for this column would be 0.00168 pounds. That's not a lot. What this answer tells us is that because the p-critical is basically zero, that this column would most likely have buckled long before it ever reached 4,800 feet tall. How would you prevent that column from failing? You would probably need to make it much wider to be able to sustain that height. So that's why you probably don't see many mountains that are six inches in diameter. You see mountains that are very, very tall, but are also exceptionally wide and narrow as they get to their peak. So compressive strength of concrete and stone is very impressive, but you must also account for buckling to really understand how tall you can build with those materials. So as I was just explaining, the way to probably make that concrete column less susceptible to buckling or bending would be to increase the moment of inertia of that system. Because the Young's modulus is going to remain the same, if we wanted to keep the length the same, then the only really thing we could change in our particular example would be to change the moment of inertia. And as we've shown in the equation, by increasing the moment of inertia, we can increase the force needed to buckle something and we can make it much stronger. This is true for both buckling and bending. And you can see mathematically how the results play out in this example below. We've got three different beams, a box beam, a square beam, and a rectangular beam. 
And what you can see in each of the cases is that the amount of material we have is the same. They all have the same exact cross-sectional area, which is 0 0.1406 inches squared. However, because we've distributed the mass differently in all three of these examples, you can see that as you go from left to right, the moments of inertia actually are decreasing. On the far left in the box beam, we've got a lot of mass really far away from the center of mass. So it's got a large moment of inertia. Whereas on the far right, we'll have a very small moment of inertia about the up and vertical axes. As a result, while all three of these structures here would have the same crushing strength, or the same compressive failure of 773 pounds for their given length, they would all have substantially different buckling loads. The one on the left would take 200 pounds to buckle, whereas the one on the right would take only a measly two pounds. So as a result, you can see that it's not just how much material you have that really matters, but it's how you use it and how you distribute that within your structure that'll really make a big difference in terms of fighting against buckling failure. Let's look at an example where you design a bike. As you can see, I've become quite an avid bike rider in the past couple of months. And as I was riding my bike one day, I realized that everything we're learning about moment of inertia, center of mass, and especially buckling is very much applicable to the design of a bike. So when you're designing a bike frame, not only do you want it to look cool, but you want to make sure that it also will sustain all of the forces that it's subjected to. And the buckling equation is very important because we want to make sure that the frame itself isn't going to bend or buckle under the weight of its rider. So let's say that hypothetically I designed the frame of the bike with a cylindrical cross section of one inch diameter. And then if I did this, I would get the following specs. I would get that the moment of inertia of a one inch cylinder is 0 0.0498 inches to the fourth. And I would get that the cross sectional area is almost a square inch at 0 0.785 inches squared. Now, as a bike designer, I might look at this design and say, okay, this hypothetically will you know, live up to the loads that my bike will be subjected to. It's not going to fail. But is this the most optimal design? So as a bike designer, I might wonder if I can make the bike lighter. Now, how would I go about doing that? I want to make the bike lighter, but I want to make sure that it still will be just as strong as the initial design that I've got with a one inch diameter. So what I can do is if I use the same material, the same shape and design of everything in the bike, the only variable that I need to change is the moment of inertia. Well, how would I go about doing this? You can actually do this by choosing a cross section that's actually larger than the first cross section. And the outer diameter in this particular example would be two inches. Now, you might be wondering, why would you do this? Well, if we look at the specs of this particular cross section, we can see that the outer diameter is about two inches. And the inner diameter is very thin, is also pretty close to two inches. What we can see we get with this cross section is actually the same moment of inertia as the first cross section. So it's just as resilient against the buckling failure as the first. But the key difference here is that when we calculate the area of material that's used to achieve this uh, moment of inertia, we can see that the area is quite a bit smaller than the first. So if I'm a bike designer, and if I use the cross section in the bottom, a hollow tube, I can achieve a seven time reduction in area, which would result, given that it's the same material with the same mass density, that would achieve seven times reduction in mass in my bike. And we all know that a light bike is really good because it makes it easier to carry around, but it also allows you as a biker the ability to go much faster. So here you can see is just one design implication of understanding the buckling equation and playing with a shape's moment of inertia. Both of those things can play very importantly into the design of not only bicycles, but all sorts of other real world systems that you want to make strong, but also light. So hopefully this helps to illustrate how important moment of inertia is in the buckling equation and as an engineer in the real world. Now let's go over a couple of different example problems by hand and showcase how the buckling equation can be used to very common statics problems. Let's first take a look at this particular problem, which is a beam, CBD, supported by a column, BA, which is pinned and pinned, 
And we're asked to determine what is the minimum allowable diameter of that column AB such that that system doesn't buckle. So let's go to the handwritten solution and figure out how we solve this problem. Let's take a look at this buckling problem. What we've got is a rod AB that's made of steel with a Young's modulus of 200 gigapascals and a cylindrical cross section, meaning that it's got a circular cross section that goes up with a length of six meters. We're asked to determine the minimum allowable diameter, D minimum, so that the rod does not buckle. So the first thing we're gonna to have to do is look at this system here and solve for the force that's in rod AB. Then we'll apply the buckling equation to make sure that our rod does not buckle and we find the minimum diameter necessary to prevent that from happening. So the first thing we need to do, just like every statics problem, is draw ourselves a free body diagram. And I'm gonna do that right now. You can see I've now drawn the free body diagram. I'll draw my XY axis so we are all on the same page. And what we can see is we've got our beam, CBD, not the oil, but the beam. And what you can see is that we've got three meters to the force PAB, which is gonna be the compressive force inside of our member AB. We've got DX and DY at the pin at the corner, and we've got the triangular distributed load at the top. Now remember, we can't use this triangular distributed load at the top, we have to replace that. So F equivalent of our triangular distributed load is going to be equal to one half the base times the height. Our base is six and our height is 10. So we have one half times six times 10. This is gonna get us 60 times one half, is 30 kilonewtons. So we'll draw that on our graph in its particular spot. And remember that this is going to act one third of the way from the tall edge of our triangle. So that's going to be two meters over here, which is effectively at six over three meters. And this is a 30 kilonewton force. Once we have that, all we really need to do is do a sum of the forces now right here to figure out what PAB is. Now the fastest way to do that is going to be to do a sum of the moments. If we did a sum of the forces in the Y, we would have both PAB and DY as unknowns. We'd be in trouble. So what we're going to have to do is solve for PAB first. And we can do that by taking the moments about D. So let me write out that equation right now. In our moments equation, we can see that we've got PAB times three, which will cause a clockwise moment about point D. And then we've got our triangular distributed load of 30, that's two meters away, which causes everything to go counterclockwise. From this equation right here, we can see that PAB is going to be equal to 20 kilonewtons, or 20 kilonewtons of compression. Okay. Now that we've got this, we can go to our buckling formula. We know that for buckling, the equation is P critical is equal to pi squared times E times I divided by K times L, all of this on the bottom squared. So if we look, we have E, we don't yet know the diameter and the diameter is actually going to affect this I component right here. So we know pi, we know E, we know K, we can figure that out. I'll explain that in just a second. And we also know L is six meters. So we know everything really, except one thing, which is the I or the moment of inertia of our rod. Now from before in our previous lectures on center of mass and moment of inertia, from our table, we know that the moment of inertia of a circle about its centroid is going to be pi over 64 d to the fourth. So now we do know this, and this actually leads us to the point that we're trying to solve for, which is the diameter required to prevent this from buckling. So the P critical is what we just calculated. Now we need everything pretty much you can plug in and solve for the diameter. Now one other point to bring up is what is this value of K? K is going to be, in this particular case, in the axis going into and out of the paper, it's going to be fixed, fixed. Because when you see that you have these pins here, these portions right here, at the top and the bottom, 
can't flex into and out of the paper very easily. But what this can do in this particular problem is it can flex this way very easily. And this is going to get us a value of k equals 1, which is pinned, pinned. And effectively what this k means is it's called the effective length factor. And this tells you how much of the length can bend and buckle. So because this bar is totally free to rotate about these points, 100% of its length can buckle. So just to reiterate, we're going to use the fact that k equals 1, 1 because we're considering pin pin, as this will go side to side and buckle. We're not going to consider the buckling where the thing could come out of the paper because that would yield a higher p critical, meaning it would be harder to buckle it. So we're looking for what situation is the easiest to buckle it because that will be the limiting factor. So we choose k equals 1. One other quick note is we want to check all of our units. We have 200 GPA, so we know that from before, a megapascal is equal to a newton per millimeter squared. This would actually mean that a GPA, or gigapascal, would be equal to a kilonewton per millimeter squared. So you can see that we've already got kilonewtons. So we'll be able to use all of our units in kilonewtons and millimeters squared along with GPA so that the problem works out. Remember that a megapascal is 1 times 10 to the 6th pascals, and a GPA is 1 times 10 to the 9th pascals. So when we plug all of this in, what we'll find is that P critical was 20 kilonewtons. This is going to be equal to pi squared times E, which is 200 GPA times pi over 64 d to the fourth, all divided by kL squared, where k is a factor of 1, and our length is 6 meters, which we'll say is 6,000 millimeters. So from this equation right here, you can see that we can solve for d to the fourth, and what this tells us is that the diameter minimum after doing all of that analysis and thinking, is that the diameter minimum is going to be equal to 52.2 millimeters. So now we've calculated this, there is one other thing that we have to figure out. We have to double check that the rod will buckle before it actually crushes using stress. So what we know is that sigma is equal to P over A, which is 20,000 newtons, divided by the area pi over 4 times 52.2 millimeters squared. This tells us that the stress developed in our rod is 9.35 megapascals which if we were to look up in our table is significantly less than the sigma yield of this material, which is 250 megapascals. Now this was not explicitly stated in the problem, so you didn't necessarily have to do this part, but it's just a good thing to check on typical Bruckling problems, which is that the rod will in fact buckle before it yields. So there you have it, that's this buckling problem. What we did was we drew a free body diagram of our system, we found the compressive load inside the member in question that we were trying to determine if it would buckle. Remember, only members that are in compression can buckle. So that's a good point to remember because it's possible in a future problem, they might ask you which of these members might buckle. Now, we only had one thing that could, but sometimes you see trusses and other things. So we found the load in this uh, beam. Then pretty much we just applied the buckling equation. We had to do a little bit of thinking about K now, because our cross-section was uniform, it was a circle, it doesn't matter which way we look. So K being 1 is going to be the limiting factor that causes this beam to buckle the easiest. So that's why we only consider K equals 1 and not the other. And pretty much after we plugged and chugged, we found our diameter minimum. And just as an engineer, our last step would be to check that our buckling equation wouldn't hold because 
we want to make sure that the stress uh, and yielding is not achieved before the buckling. So what we found is that a rod will buckle before it yields and therefore Euler's theory is valid and we're all good to go. Let's take a look at this problem here. In this example, what we can see is we've got a beam, BC, with a distributed load at the top with a load intensity of W, supported by a column AB, which is pinned and pinned. We're asked to determine in this question what is the W max that can be applied to the top beam without causing member AB to buckle and fail. So let's jump to the handwritten solution and figure out how to do this one. Let's take a look at this problem. We're told that we've got a bar, AB, is made of 836 steel with a 200 GPA and a yield stress of 360 megapascals. We're told that the bar has a rectangular cross section, which we can see is 20 millimeters by 30 millimeters. We're asked to determine the maximum allowable load intensity, W max at the top, as we can see is a rectangular distributed load, so that the rod does not buckle using a safety factor of two against buckling. So the first step in this, as in many statics problem, is to draw our free better diagram. Let's get started. Now drawn the free better diagram, we've got PAB on the far end, five meters away from point C, where we've replaced the pin with CX and CY. We've also got the rectangular distributed load with the load intensity of W at the top. Now what's interesting about this question is that we're asked to solve for W. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to solve for the force in AB in terms of W. So the way that we're gonna do that is to sum the moments about point C and solve for the force in PAB in terms of W. The first step we really need to do is to solve for the F equivalent of our rectangle, which we know is just the base times the height, which is going to be W times five. So that distributed load will act right in the middle of this system right here. So this is W times five at a distance of five over two away from point C. So what we'll do is we can now sum our moments about point C, set that equal to zero, and that'll be equal to PAB times five, which will be negative, because that goes clockwise, plus W times five times five over two counterclockwise. So ultimately, what you can see is gonna happen, we've got lots of factors of five here. We would bring PAB times five over to this side, we would divide by five, so these fives would cancel pretty much. And we'll be left with PAB is equal to 2.5 W. Now that we've done all of this, our next step is to determine the K values and the moments of inertia for the X and Y axes, because this is what's going to guide the rest of our calculations. Now, I've got the X axes here drawn in red, and I've got the Y axes here drawn in blue. What we can see is that in the X axes, if we were to buckle about the X, that's kind of the axis that's here. And what that would mean is that would mean that the beam is going into and out of the paper in buckling. Okay, so X axis buckling, you can't really even see on the paper. If we're buckling about the Y axis, our beam would start to buckle like this. And you can hopefully see that in this drawing I'm making right here in the blue. So what we can see is that our beam is going to be more likely to buckle about the Y axis than in the X axis, because along the Y axis, we would say that it is pinned pinned and K equals one. For the X axis, we would say it's fixed fixed, which is K equals 0 0.5. So we know that the limiting factor would be this one right here. The X axis would be, or sorry, the Y axis would be the axis that we're more likely to buckle about because it's going to be easier because more of the beam can buckle. The next thing we wanna check is to see what the moments of inertia are about the X and Y axis. So for area moment of inertia about the Y axis, what we would have would be 1 12th the height times the base cubed. This would tell us we have 1 12th the height, which is 30 millimeters, times 20 millimeters cubed. For the x-axis, 
when we're buckling about this one right here, the distance that matters is the 30. So we would actually have 1 12th base times height cubed, which would be 1 12th 20 millimeters times 30 millimeters cubed. So what you can see is that I about the Y axis is going to be less than I about the X axis, which again means that it's going to be easier to buckle about the Y axis, which is why it is our limiting factor. Given that the Y has one out on both of these things, we know that it is essentially impossible for this beam to buckle in the X axis or into and out of the paper before it buckles along this axis here, which is the Y axis going left and right. So as a result, we will consider our analysis only for the Y axis. So now that we're sure that Y axis buckling is more likely to occur, we would actually solve for the moment of inertia IY, and we would get that IY is equal to 20,000 millimeters to the fourth. That's from this equation right here. Next thing we need to do is we need to consider the safety factor because that's really important in this problem. Safety factor, remember, is equal to the maximum limit over what's actually being experienced in our problem. So the maximum limit is just P critical. And the actual thing that we're experiencing is PAB, which is what we've already kind of solved for in terms of W down here. So we write this equation here now what we'll do is we'll plug in what P critical is. So P critical, remember, is pi squared times E times I. And the moment of inertia in question is going to be the Y axis. And we divide this by K times L, that whole thing squared. So this is our top piece, the P critical component. And we divide that by PAB, which we'll say is 2.5 W. And we set all of this equal to 2 because that's what our safety factor was in our problem. Now that we've got that, we can see we've got E is 200 gigapascals. We've got IY, which is 20,000 millimeters to the fourth. We've got K, which is that K is one. And we've got L, which is three meters, or what we'll say is 3,000 millimeters. So remember that what we can do now is we can say that one megapascal is equal to one Newton per millimeter squared. This is 1 times 10 to the 6th pascals. We can say that 1 GPA, gigapascal, is 1 times 10 to the 9th pascals. It'll equal kilonewtons per millimeter squared. So this has already been solved for in terms of kilonewtons pretty much. 2.5 W is in kilonewtons. So over here, our units are going to be kilonewtons per millimeter squared, so we're good to go. So we can just plug everything in. So when we do all that, let's see what we get. We'll have pi squared times 200 gigapascals times 20,000 millimeters cubed, wait a minute, not cubed, to the fourth, sorry, divided by one times 3,000 millimeters squared divided by all of that by 2.5 W, set that equal to 2, and what we find is that W max is equal to 0 0.8773 kilonewtons per meter. The final step in this question is going to be to check against yielding, because we are actually in fact given a sigma yield. So we need to make sure that our bar does buckle before it yields. Otherwise, this equation actually would not be true. So for yielding, we know that sigma AB is equal to PAB over the area of AB. We know that PAB is equal to 2.5 times W, so that is 2.5 times the W we just calculated, which is 0 0.8773 kilonewtons per meter, divided by the area which is going to be 20 millimeters times 30 millimeters. And what we find is that well, this is going to give us kilonewtons per millimeter squared, which is GPA, which tells us that we've got 0 0.0366 GPA, 
which is going to be equal to 36 megapascals, which this is less than sigma y, so we are all good. The beam buckles before it yields. And there we go. I got a nice little smiley face guy there because now we're done the problem. Because our beam will buckle before it yields, this means that our answer for W is all good. It's 0 0.8773 kilonewtons per meter. And that's it. So the steps just to reiterate what we did. We drew a free better diagram. We summed our moments, put our compressive load on our beam relative to the W on top. Then the interesting part, really specific to buckling, is that we checked the y-axis versus x-axis end conditions and the effective length factor. It was easier to buckle about the y-axis, as we said. Then we also checked the moments of inertia about the y-axis, which would be the beam going this way, pretty much, left and right. And then we checked about the x-axis, which would be the beam going towards you and away from you. We found that the y-axis moment of inertia is less than the, the x-axis moment of inertia. So the beam is more likely to buckle about the y-axis due to both of these factors, which is why we don't even consider the x-axis at all. Now, had we found that the x-axis moment of inertia was less here, then what we would have done is we would have had to do this equation two times, and we would have had to solve for W max in both of those conditions to see which one was most likely to buckle or which one was lower. In this case, we didn't have to do that and pretty much we used our safety factor, we solved for W max, and just confirming that the beam uh, buckled before it yielded, we were good and finished the problem. There you go. Well, that's it for today's lecture. Hopefully you've got a much better understanding of what buckling is, how the equation works, and how you apply that to both the real world and statics problems. I'll see you all next time. As you may have guessed, if I try and bend the stick this way by applying compressive loads on either side, it's not too, it's not too hard. I just broke the stick. It's not <laughs> No, I love the stick! <laughs>